Hello, fellow humans. This is Robert Roach on the Type 1 Planet podcast. I'm excited to be continuing the transhumanist discussion and debate that we began with Dr. Anders Sandberg back in episode six. So go check that one out after you listen to this. So a big part of considering our future as a species is understanding how humanity will evolve with the presence of seemingly godlike technology. And if that evolution can be done in such a way that actually benefits the majority, if not all human beings. And my guest, James Hughes, is a bioethicist. He's a sociologist. He's the executive director for the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. And the mission of the IEET claims that it promotes the ideas about how technological process can increase freedom, happiness, and human flourishing in democratic societies. They believe that technological process can be a catalyst for positive human development so long as we ensure that technologies are safe and equitably distributed. So this is what Ted James Hughes calls a techno-progressive orientation. We dive into the balance between technological progress and democracy, what technologies are a human right, whether limits should be placed on the freedom that people have to control their own bodies, and what is the theoretical deep dive of what our future looks like in this strange technological future. Anders suggested that I speak to James because they have different perspectives on what is the best possible post-human future. This kind of analysis that reviews all sides of an argument is what Type 1 Planet is all about. The pursuit of truth is a winding and forking and subtly beautiful path that we should all walk. So I invite you to try this and to put your beliefs and your biases to the test at all times. Um, I hope you enjoy this episode. Please check out our social media, our website, type1planet.net. Share these episodes. Tell people about the conversations. And please reach out to us if you've got ideas, if you want to join the team, if you want to uh, get a guest on here. The big project behind Type 1 Planet is finding ways to do that with all ideas. Hello and welcome to the Type 1 Planet podcast. I'm Robert Roach and I'm joined by our guest, James Hughes, a bioethicist, sociologist, He's the executive director for the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. He's the author of Citizen Cyborg, Why Democratic Societies Must Respond to the Redesigned Human of the Future. And James, you're also a member of the Neuroethics Society, Association for Futurist Leaders, American Society of Bioethics and Humanities. The list goes on. So it's really wonderful to have you on with me today. Thanks for joining. My pleasure. So the mission of Type 1 Planet is to reimagine our civilization so we can enter into a long-term sustainable state that's both in equilibrium with ourselves, with our planetary environment, and also our technology. So how human, how humanity adopts and exists, uh, you know, adopts and exists alongside rapidly expanding technological innovations is a big part of this conversation. And uh, I already had a great time talking to Anders Sandberg, who uh, provided a fascinating insight into the transhumanist perspective. And he immediately suggested that I learn more about uh, these topics from you and talk about things like techno-progressive transhumanism. So let's start there. So for the layman listener, what's techno-progressive transhumanism? What's your your favorite topic to bring up at, hmm. at dinner time? Well, um, let's go back a bit, uh, which is when I first got connected with transhumanism back in the early 90s. Um, I had been a political activist for more than a decade at that point. And um, a lot of the people involved in transhumanism at the time were one flavor or another of libertarian, and I am not. Um, I'm more of a social democrat or democratic socialist. And so um, one of the puzzles I had back in the 90s when I was in grad school and then after was um, how the progressives lost track of techno-optimism. Basically, you know, if you go back to the Enlightenment, there was this tradition of people who wanted to transform society in a more egalitarian and liberal way, uh, make democracies out of monarchies and so forth. Um, Those folks were generally optimistic that science, reason, and technology were going to produce a better world. And then I'd clock it roughly around World War II that um, things began to shift. The bomb, um, ecological concerns, the 1960s counterculture, a lot of different trends began to converge. And 
On the left, when I became a bioethicist in graduate school, we had the joke that you only needed one word to become a bioethicist, and that word was no, because you were going to say no to everything. Um, and uh, I was not. I was someone who thought that if we came up with a cure for cancer, that'd be great, you know, um, better than sliced bread. So one of the questions I began to have was, what, what was this trajectory of thought, these different ideas, techno-optimism and democracy and egalitarianism, and how had they mixed and merged over time? So I began to write about that and did a uh, podcast called uh, Change Surfer Radio, and eventually hooked up with Nick Bostrom and folks who were involved in the European side of transhumanism. And um, those folks were much more open-minded about politics than the Silicon Valley libertarians tended to be. So um, I became the executive director of the World Transhumanist Association and began to organize that globally. But we had a lot of fights because, uh, in short, transhumanism is just the idea that he, we're going to have or we already do have technologies that allow us to transcend the capabilities of the human body. Um, and that people should have a right to use those technologies to become smarter, longer lived, healthier, and so forth. Um, that's not much of a set of political agreements. You know, that doesn't tell you whether you think um, th we should have a king or a democracy or whether we should have universal health care or not, or whether we should have an FDA or not. Um, so around uh, 2005, we started the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. I had written Citizen Cyborg, and in Citizen Cyborg, I had argued for what I call democratic transhumanism, which was a kind of synthesis of a social democratic approach to politics with the transhumanist ideas. And um, the term democratic transhumanism never took off, but we started to call ourselves techno-progressives. And techno-progressives uh, Techno-progressivism has um, a broader um, uh, catchment. It, 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 it implies more issues than just the human enhancement issues that transhumanism refers to. So, for instance, um, people's attitudes about um, ecology, which have little or nothing to do with human enhancement, um, often reflect the same biases or thought processes that they have about human enhancement. So if you think that the natural order is something that we shouldn't be interfering in and that uh, human beings are a cancer on the planet or whatever your ecological politics are, that's one kind of approach. And another would be to say, look, we've been changing this ecosystem ever since we became hominids and um, we have a responsibility to uh, try to remediate the things that we're doing. And one of the ways we might do that is through geoengineering or uh, genetically modifying crops to be more resilient to the climate changes that we've imposed. Um, those kinds of thoughts are techno-progressive, whether they have anything to do with transhumanism or not. Um, so uh, techno-progressivism has uh, become a popular term among a very small set, mostly former transhumanists or, tra or current transhumanists who align to the left, um, but also with people who don't call themselves transhumanists, um, who have um, uh, politics that are at the intersection of techno-optimism and progressivism. Interesting. And it, it, it was interesting uh, having a conversation previously, a much more libertarian, I guess, version of this conversation and um, versus what you're describing now, it seems from the perspective of the mission of this project and this company uh, to potentially be a better fit uh, for what we're trying to do, because we we're seeing, you know, we're trying to describe a future of humanity that we think would be a better alternative to other potential futures, for example, humanity going extinct or getting kicked back to a hunter gatherer state or something like that. And so as a futurist, you're not just simply observing trends, making predictions. Would you say that you have a sense of mission of morality around a future that you'd like to guide our civilization into? Absolutely. I mean, I used to teach in a bioethics program at university of Chicago. And um, one of the questions we always had was, is an ethicist someone who is, um, an expert on ethical debates or someone who has an ethical opinion that they try to argue for. And um, I'm definitely on the latter camp. You know, I've always, had, I've always been uh, uh, an opinionated person and the IET has always uh, staked out a point of view. 
Um, our initial programs were things like the longevity dividend, which is that um, we've argued for uh, anti research federal investments in research into anti aging therapies alongside uh, universal health care reform so that everyone has access to them and alongside reforms of the FDA clinical trial pathways. You know, some people in our um, uh, some advocates for longevity therapies um, are completely hostile to clinical trial um, regimes, regulatory systems. And we think that that's dumb because, you know, if you set up a, an offshore clinic in the first place, no one will know whether it's safe to do what you're doing there. And in the second place, it's not going to be accessible to most people. So um, the way to get this thing done is through public policy. So we're strong advocates for the connection between ethical points of view and political and policy points of view. That's one aspect of our work. And um, generally, we are argumentative about uh, both the Luddite um, strains of progressivism and the libertarian strains of futurism and uh, see ourselves as, you know, counterpoised between those. Okay. Now, um, in the mission of the IEET, you know, you talk about pursuing for, you know, in, in an equitable distribution, freedom, happiness, flourishing in within democratic societies. So let's just Let's just describe this a bit for our listeners who maybe are completely unfamiliar. How does transhumanism, how does technology allow us to be more free, more happy, allow us to flourish? You know, wh why should we be aiming to live longer, for example? And in the obviously, I, I want to live longer. You want to live longer. You know, we want to see more of time. But why is it that it's important that humanity in general starts to live longer? Well, starting with just the ethics of living longer, I think we all have an interest in living longer ourselves. I don't think very many people would argue that it's wrong and most would argue that it's right for people to do what's in the interest of their own living longer. The question comes at, at what cost to others. Um, and so we're more interested, I think, in promoting uh, longevity for all, uh, life expectancy for all. One of our complaints about a lot of the focus on longevity right now, for instance, is that um, it's about elite um, investments in various kinds of gene therapies or supplementation or whatever, instead of the fact that life expectancy has reversed in the United States. Uh, people are not living longer. They're living shorter lives than they were um, a decade ago. And that's because of the growth of deaths of despair, which is probably principally linked to economic insecurity, alcoholism, drug abuse, suicide, um, you know, the number of mass killings that we have is, although not a direct contributor to the life expectancy problem, certainly a sign that there's something wrong with you know, American culture right now. Um, and so at a global level, the principal drivers of life expectancy are not which vitamins people are taking. It's whether they have access to basic medicine and mm. education and, um, you know, uh, economic opportunity. So um, I think there's, there's a strong ethical case to be made for life itself and for longer life for all. Um, the, having a longer life also changes the way that you orient to your society. You, t you tend to take more responsibility for the future than if you expect a very short life. Um, so we expect that as people live longer, they will be more interested in the fate of their grandchildren and great grandchildren and themselves in the future. They'll be more interested in remediating climate change. Older people actually consume fewer resources than younger people. So as society ages, that's good for that society in that regard. Older people are less violent. The majority of violence is committed by men between the ages of 15 and 25. So the fewer of those there are and the more old people there are, the, the less violence. So there are a lot of positive benefits to having uh, longevity in society. Mm. Um, that's a pretty easy case to make. That, that's probably the easiest case we can make. When it, the harder ones are, you know, the right for you to change your own brain, uh, the right for you to change the genes of your kids. Those are where we really get into the weeds sure. on, on these issues. Sure, and that's where the ec especially equitable distribution really starts to starts yes. to take off. You know, and and 
and we'll get to it, but talking about democratic versus totalitarian regimes uh, using that kind of technology as well. Um, right. So, I would say that the connection between democracy and science or democracy and technology is a pretty complicated story, but um, in general, it's pretty hard to imagine uh, the kinds of democracy that we all want without a highly educated, advanced communication system society. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the spread of literacy uh, brought us the Protestant Reformation and then the spread of democratic ideas, the spread of enlightenment ideas. Um, and really, I see techno progressivism as just one strand of the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment argued that there was a, uh, a feedback, a complementarity between science, reason, and technology on the one hand, and democracy and freedom on the other. Mm. And um, so we're trying to explore the many ways in which that occurs. Mm. All right. Well, we're there. What does progressive democratization look like? You know, what is that? Uh, why is, you know, I think on your website, you wrote uh, that technology the mastery of technology requires progressive democratization. So wh what, what does that uh, relationship exist? Well, let's start with the human enhancement side. If, when the, the Pew Research Center has been doing great research on um, people's attitudes about brain implants, life uh, longevity medicine, automation, things like that, in general, people are at least Americans, are optimistic about these technologies having benefits in the future and think that people sh should probably have a right to use them. But they are very pessimistic that because of the inequalities of our society, um, that they and because of the corporate influence uh, over the way that things get rolled out, that they're going to be safe and that everyone's going to have access to them. So having a society that um, where there is confidence in democratic institutions to ensure the safety and efficacy of medicines, uh, to um, look at uh, the effects that we are wreaking on the environment and um, able to enact programs to, to stop those effects or to, you know, to remediate them. Um, having that kind of confidence in democratic institutions is pretty key for um, people accepting the uh, positive benefits of technology in the future. That's mm -hmm. one aspect of it. Um, now, the kinds of democracy that we've had um, are, of course, highly inadequate. Uh, no one would argue that liberal democracy is perfect, um, especially the last you know, eight years in the United States. Um, so uh, I think that we're very interested in the question of um, ways that we can improve democracy. Um, and there are many parts of society that need to be democratized. Um, so the workplace is one place that is not very de democratic. You basically give up your rights when you enter the workplace, or many of them. Um, so the democratization of work is one thing that we're focusing on this year. We have a program on the future of work. Uh, we're working on questions like... Um, what a democratic metaverse would look like, uh, what dem democratized gig work would look like, um, saying, you know, that those ships have probably sailed. We're probably going to get some kind of metaverse. We're probably going to get some kind of gig work. So the question isn't horrors, stop the world, let me off. It's how do we democratize them, make sure that people have um, freedom and equality and, and voice within those institutions. Mm. In terms of democratizing society, of course, the redistribution of wealth and power is one key way that we do that. We make sure that um, uh, a billionaire is enabled to buy the major means of communication and s screw it all up and fill it up with fascists. Um, but we also uh, need to imagine what new forms of democratic participation might look like. We've had the rapid decline of many of the institutions that used to be the bulwarks of democracy, trade unions, political parties, civic organizations. Um, all of those have, are on pretty rough skids now. And people thought that the internet would pick up the slack, that we would all start doing flash mobs from Facebook or Twitter or whatever, and that that would be the, the answer. And it hasn't yet. We haven't seen new forms of citizen organization, citizen empowerment 
from electronic tools that we thought we might. But it's certainly, I think, inevitable that we will develop better democratic institutions through electronic participation. And we're very interested in liquid democracy, e-democracy, as it's called in some places, um, ways of turning over, for instance, budgeting decisions to uh, everyone in a city and saying, uh, everybody vote on how we should be spending our budget or um, uh, allowing greater access to federal data uh, so that there's more transparency. Um, all these questions are, are weird now in the context of the rise of neo-fascism and all of their kind of distorted understandings of these things, you know, that investigating Hunter Biden's laptop is the most important investigative task of the U.S. Congress or something. But um, that's just the, you know, I, in a way, you know, the rise of neo-fascism is, a, I think, also a story of democracy. Those folks used to be under the thumb of the Connecticut um, liberal Republicans. And eventually the uh, the crazy wing of U.S. society decided to <laughs> assert their religious fascism and and take over the Republican Party. So that's, in a way, it's a, a form of democracy. But anyway, that's a longer story. But um, I, I think we are, you know, democracy is uh, a fluid concept and has many aspects. One is uh, multi-party elections. I don't see that going away anytime soon. I don't think there's any example of a society without multi-party elections that I would call democratic. Um, but also the degree of civil liberties in a society. Um, I've been arguing with some tankies recently about whether Stalin was more democratic than FDR. And it's like, look, it's 1930s, the United States had some problems. It was not great for black people, for gay people, for women, but it beat the hell out of being in the USSR mm. for a lot, in a lot of ways in terms of civil liberties. So if, you, if we have a kind of universal yardstick of civil liberties, I think we can look around the world and say some societies are more democratic than others, and we just need to keep pushing in that direction. And for me, Northern Europe, um, social democratic Northern Europe has always been the current yardstick measure of what you know the ideal democracy looks like. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you look at some of those countries in Northern Europe, and they thrive with you know dozens of political parties that are you know, have to collaborate. You have to get a majority of different political parties to get something passed. And that's something that we're just missing here in the United States. Um, we're, we're, I've been working with Aaron Hamlin. He actually, he, his episode comes out this week. He is the executive director for the center for election science. And, um, and they're, uh, they're working on getting implemented a style of voting called approval voting. It's not that it's not very complicated. I won't go into it though, but, Basically, these are simple election technologies that take away many of these effects that push us into polls where we only have two political parties. You know, right now our current system is set up in that way. And I think of it, I, I bring this up because from in my in my from my perspective, that's one of the first things we have to address before we can start to have a government that is dynamic enough to start to think in these long term. Uh, perspectives that you're that we're talking about right now, um, and and if let's say that we are able to get to a place where we can have an open conversation with politicians, with government parties about uh, these long term concepts, about for example policy around uh, let's just say genetic modification or or similar technologies, you know what are the policy positions that are on your mind if you were able to sit down with the top leaders of our country and say, Hey, um, you know, this might not be on your mind now, but it should be, we should be talking about implementing policy around this today. Uh, what are those kind? what are those topics that you would bring to that table? Well, I've always followed the dictum of Antonio Gramsci that, um, you should have optimism of the will and pessimism of the intellect. Um, and that's led me to be pretty pragmatic about my political goals, but, um, I've also strongly supported um, technological uh, integrating technological foresight into government policy. And so I would definitely want, um, for instance, the, um, the uh, Office of uh, Technology Assessment that 
used to exist in the U.S. Congress. It was uh, killed by Republicans 30 years ago when they um, had the Republican Revolution in 1994. Um, but the Office of Technology Assessment used to do great work on saying, okay, we've got this new technology. What, what, are the, what is the evidence saying about its consequences for society? What kinds of policies should we have? And that kind of work goes on in many different ways throughout federal and European agencies. I would have to say Europe is a lot better at this now. Um, European regulators have for instance, recently enacted the uh, Digital Services Act, the D Digital Market Act, and the uh, AI Act, all of which are much better than any of the regulations of algorithms and uh, social media and uh, digital services that we have in the United States. So that kind of work happens in the European Parliament. It happens in the Defense uh, Department in the United States, um, but it should happen in a more systematic way. Um, in terms of, you know, when we're talking about uh, alternative democratic ideas, one of the things that people have talked about is uh, citizen juries around technology, um, ha bringing together random groups of citizens, educating them about a technology and, and then distilling their thoughts. Um, I don't know that, that that's been terribly successful. The evidence kind of suggests that people just reaffirm their biases through those processes. So... That's you know one of the difficulties is that we're still using human beings. Um, I've also written about, for instance, algorithmic governance, which is um, the idea that the government agencies themselves are being automated and that we are moving towards um, increasing use of algorithms um, in the place of bureaucracy or the or the you know turning bureaucracy into algorithms, um, which I think is both inevitable and desirable to the extent that algorithms are more modifiable and transparent than bureaucracies are. So um, hopefully we can do better things with them. Um, you know, you were also talking about the political parties, getting the political parties to listen. And one of the things I've paid close attention to is the attempts to use um, uh, electronic participation in political parties in Europe the uh, Podemos in Spain and um, the Five Star Movement in Italy and the Pirate Parties, they've, they've all been exper experimenting with different kinds of electronic participation, the electronic aggregation of, uh, of party platforms and so forth. Um, I think the Five Star Movement shows that that can be <laughs> the, a bad process in some ways. They ended up you know, being a vaccine conspiracy party because that, uh, the people who were participating were all vaccine conspiracists. But, um, but I think that we need to do more of that, have more direct participation in our party apparatuses so that people feel a sense of ownership over the democratic process. Are you referring to kind of not necessarily voting, but is this, is this a form of voting that you're referring to? Uh, how, like, what does that participation look like? Well, the goal, at least in the um, the liquid democracy parties like Podemos and Five Star, was that instead of having a group of policy elites write a party platform and then try to get it passed by the party, that you would have a more bottom up process. That you would say, "What do you think are the most important issues that the government should be, the party should be addressing?" and you somehow distill all that up into policy. Um, I don't know that the evidence has shown that that works very well yet, but um, it's the right idea. It's the right direction. Okay. All right. I'm putting together a, a panel potentially around election technology and and rediscovering or, you know, reinventing our democracy. So I'm going to keep you in yeah. mind <laughs> if you would want to. Oh, good. Yeah. And I just also mentioned ranked choice voting, I think, is one of the more positive examples of this. It's really hard to imagine using ranked choice voting without electronic vote aggregation. Um, and recently, the, the election result in Alaska, for instance, you know, would have been a Republican, but it turned out to be a Democrat because everyone hated <laughs> the Republicans were divided and they, they voted for the Democrat as number two. And so I, I'm very excited about things like ranked choice voting. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll send you when the approval voting episode comes out, I'll send it to you because he talks a lot about rank, the failures and but also benefits of ranked choice voting as well. So um, uh, keeping in in line a little bit here with uh, the ideas around democracy, you know, your book, Citizen Cyborg, you address some really interesting questions. And I wanted to ask you one of the questions that came up in my mind. Um, what limits should we place 
on the freedom for people to control their bodies. You know, it, it's from your, from a, a, a civilizational planning perspective or from a moral perspective, should we place limits as, uh, you know, on the spectrum of libertarian to, uh, to, to, to not, <laughs> I guess. Right. Well, I, I am a strong civil libertarian in the uh, John Stuart Millian tradition. And that tradition basically says that um, I should have as much freedom as that we should all have as much freedom as we possibly can until we hurt others. Right. And of course, the interpretation of when you hurt others is part of the con contestation of that in society. So a Christian conservative would say my gay marriage is hurting their marriage somehow. And <laughs> and I just disagree. You know, I, um, you don't want to be married to a man, don't marry a man. Um, but in the case of human enhancement, um, people often argue that if we allow these technologies to move forward, it will cause various kinds of social harms. Um, they argue, for instance, that um, in a society that is unequal, where uh, these benefits of these enhancement technologies will be unequally distributed, that eventually this will exacerbate that inequality and um, give certain powers or benefits to elites that the rest of the people, that will harm the rest of us and harm democracy. Now, I strongly agree that inequality in society harms society. And I think there's always been a case for redistributive social policies, the expansion of the welfare state, uh, uh, ju juridical and, and legal and political equality um, pushed so that it creates more social equality. Um, I would put the focus there. And, and I would say that the idea that me being able to take ADD medication to treat ADD, um, eventually leading to a society where the Terminator wants to crush the weaklings is as hypothetical as someone saying that gay marriage is going to harm traditional marriage. You know, it's just, well, I don't see the logic of how you get from A to B right. with that argument. Right. Now, I do think that there's a role for the state. Um, I, I would say that one of the places where libertarian transhumanists or libertarian advocates for human enhancement um, don't put enough thought is what happens when we get to the point where there are technologies that are so beneficial and so safe that um, parents not giving, I, I'm fine for adults not taking something, even though it's been proven to be safe, except you have the case of, for instance, vaccination, right? Vaccination is uh, uh, the paradigmatic case where you're imposing harm on society through your individual freedom. And um, I think uh, a strongly coercive vaccination regime in the context of a dangerous uh, uh, spread of a disease is legitimate. And that's, you know, kind of the paradigmatic libertarian versus uh, democratic mm -hmm. idea. Um, but then the obligation to protect the interests of children um, is even uh, more pressing than the obligation uh, to, for instance, force people to take a vaccine. So if someone says, um, I don't believe I should ever eat a vegetable, um, I'm like, fine. But if they say, I'm never going to feed vegetables to my kids because I think they cause Satanism or whatever, I think, you know, we have an obligation to say, you should probably feed your kids vegetables. You're probably going to harm your kids if you don't feed them vegetables. Now, am I willing to lock up a parent or take away their kid because they don't feed them vegetables? I guess not. Um, am I willing to do so uh, with uh, a Jehovah's Witness who says, I'm not going to give my kid a blood transfusion, even though they're going to die on the operating table? Yeah, I am willing to get a judge, as every doctor does in the United States. They immediately call a judge and say, sorry, you don't get that choice. You're not allowed to kill your kids just because of your religious beliefs. Um, we're going to give them a blood transfusion. And I think we're going to get to that point someday with human enhancement technologies. And we should probably start talking about that now. What a human enhancement that is that safe and that effective uh, would look like. Um, some people think uh, denying kids psychiatric medication or ADD medication um, when they have a clear need for it is that kind of harm. I, I think it's a debate. But um, in terms of regulating <clears throat> these 
technologies. I think another part of the restriction on human freedom is that we have an obligation to ensure that everyone has an informed choice when they choose to take something. So part of the regulation of freedom around medicine is that we need to impose a regulatory regime on medicine to ensure that we know the costs, benefits, efficacy of the therapies before people are given the choice to take them. Um, So some would argue that the existence of an FDA or the existence of prescriptive controls on drugs is uh, a restriction on freedom, and and I agree. But it's one of the prescription, uh, you know, one of the controls on freedom that I think is uh, acceptable and defensible. Um, And that's one of the key places where the libertarian and non-libertarian sides of transhumanism part company is whether you think the government has the right to impose that kind of regulatory control. Now, do I think the government, as some has proposed, like uh, Francis Fukuyama, wanted to create a federal agency to look at all human enhancement technologies and ban them because of future societal costs? Now, I'm opposed to that um, for the reasons I've already said, but um, I, I think our current regulatory apparatus in Europe and the United States, which says the responsibility of the government is to ensure safety and efficacy. And after that, it's up to you and your doctor. I think that's perfectly fine. Interesting. There's a deep philosophical conversation here around what is mandatory, voluntary. And then uh, the one thing you haven't spoken about is truly forbidden. Um, what te- right. what technologies, even if even if they're non-existent technologies, should be forbidden in, in this model? Good it's a great question because I've, I have written an essay um, on w- when is a technology like a gun? You know, I'm, I'm for gun control and I'm for banning assault weapons. I don't think people should be able to own tanks or nuclear weapons. Um, individuals shouldn't. And sometimes the discussion around human enhancement acts as if we're talking about uh, tanks or automatic weapons and nothing on the table is of that category. Now, Having a billion dollars is as much power as having a tank or a nuclear weapon, right? You can do a lot of damage with a billion dollars. So you're worried about people having so much power in our society that they are a threat to the public safety. Worry about billionaires. But if you are worrying about somebody taking ADHD drugs or trying to extend their life expectancy by 10 years or, you know, tattoos or body modification or whatever we're talking about, none of that is in that category, right? Now, if we eventually invent a pill, here's my hypothetical. You invent a pill that makes you a million times smarter than everybody else, and it costs a billion dollars to to buy. Uh, You become a Lex Luthor type super villain villain with that kind of a pill, right? Yeah, I'm I'm for banning that. uh, Or at least I'm for saying only very specific people under very specific controls should be allowed to to have access to a technology like Mm. that. We're nowhere close to anything like well, that, right? Well, in the in the sphere of human enhancement. In the spirit of human enhancement, yes, but then we start to dive into artificial intelligence. And that that billion dollar pill is having a computer that can do that work for you. Yes. You know? Okay. But artificial intelligence just, you know, artificial intelligence is so far separate from the question of human enhancement. It may not be in the future, and it, it will accelerate our ability to do human enhancement and eventually brain co- machine interfaces will connect us to artificial intelligence in interesting and important ways. So yes, I do think artificial intelligence poses hypothetical risks to the future. The, 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 the proximate risks, w- w- the risks we're already seeing are things like algorithmic bias, you know, that data sets are full of racism and sexism that then get reflected in the algorithm, things like that. Um, and, you know, over every technology gets overhyped and overused at first that people think it's going to be the cure-all to everything and it isn't. And it, sometimes it's worse. You know, when we first had the spread of obstetrics and gynecology in the United States 150 years ago, We also had midwives, lay midwives, and they got banned. And the obstetricians and gynecologists were going around saying, we're the only ones who could deliver babies. And everyone's, oh, yes, because you went to France and got trained, you you know how to deliver babies. But they were coming straight from autopsies and delivering babies and giving women purpural disease and killing lots of women in ways that midwives were not, right? So we we over-embraced 
uh, obstetrics and gynecology. Now, today, obstetrics and gynecology is a lot safer and a lot more scientific. But back then, we over-embraced it first. I think the same thing's happening with artificial intelligence is that um, we have an industry uh, around every technology. We have an industry saying it's going to be the the cure to everything. And, and often it isn't quite the way that they say. Mm. But um, now the, the big fear that people in the futurist community have about artificial intelligence is AGI, artificial general intelligence, um, jumping out of a box, bootstrapping itself to super intelligence and taking over the world. I have a lot of problems with that um, as an anxiety. I think it's extremely um, anthropomorphic, anthropocentric um, an idea of what life, how life behaves, you know, we, there, we, we do see life wanting to grow around the world, but, you know, the idea that, um, an, an artificial intelligence is immediately going to act like, a, a a roided out 13 year old boy, as soon as it pops out of a box, or that that's the only way that artificial intelligence will start to screw up our lives. I mean, I think artificial life, um, so the, the basic problem is when does a machine start doing something on its own interest instead of what you told it to do, right? So that's basically the life question is, well, when, when does a machine start to think I have interests of my own that have to be pursued regardless of what I've been told by others? Now, Nick Bostrom or others would say that there's also a problem with giving super intelligence. Like if you have, you know, if your arm could suddenly lift a million pounds, you want to be very careful how you use that arm because you could knock down your house. Um, and that's that's the problem of orthogonality or having powerful tools that you don't um, adequately uh, constrain or prescribe mm -hmm. the behavior of that tool. I, the artificial general intelligence problem is when does it start to have a will and intents of its own? I don't think we should be doing, I don't think we should be trying to create artificial intelligence yet that has wills and intents of its own. I don't want to have to argue with my refrigerator about my diet, you know, um, uh, or whether it feels like giving food out today, you know. So um, I don't think very many of us have an interest in that. The, the very few use cases are things like, you know, caretaking robots. Would it be better to have a caretaking robot that had a more fully developed inner consciousness so it could have more empathy with the human that it's taking care of? I'm not sure it would. We in, in this domain, we talk about philosophical zombies, which is, it's quite easy to imagine that we will have artificial intelligence robots that act like humans, that are able to detect and anticipate our emotions and our needs extremely well without having anything inside that we would call consciousness or self-awareness right. or intents or purposes of its own. So, um, yeah, I think it's a very complicated domain, but um, most of the thinking about it I'm unhappy with because I think they are kind of locked into some sci-fi paradigms that um, are unlikely to be the ones we face. I, I think, James, I really agree with you on this because, um, you know, the what I'm concerned about in respect to artificial intelligence is very related to many of the things that we've already been talking about, specifically, you know, for example, equitable distribution of resources. If one country, and I think that's why you have this, we're seeing this massive race right now um, across the, the planet to, to develop better and better artificial intelligence, the stronger your AI is, the more the AI is being, is being created to have better money making capabilities and better weapon capabilities, you know, essentially, you know, and, and some things in, in the middle, like, you know, how can we feed 10 billion people and that kind of stuff? Great. Let's have a really powerful mind to think about that. But, um, the, you know, the equitable distribution of resources, you know, a, 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 a country's ability to compete on the international stage will eventually potentially be tied to whether or not they have a strong artificial intelligence capability. It's very much implicit in our relationship with China right now because the Biden administration has imposed a ban on the export of high-end artificial chips that could be used for artificial intelligence uh, purposes. And Xi Jinping has realized that the investments that they've made over the last decade in um, computer chip manufacturing has not produced very much. Um, so I think some of the anxieties that we have about the geopolitical consequences of artificial intelligence competition have been overblown, at least in the Chinese case. 
But um, I definitely think that, you know, one of the things that we've looked at at the IET is the effects of uh, both human enhancement and artificial intelligence on war and um, the control of battle spaces, the um, uh, enhancement of the warrior themselves. And uh, I definitely think it's going to have a number of direct consequences. We're already seeing some of it in the use of drones, for instance, in Ukraine. 100%. Uh, so let's, before we finish today, and, and it kills me to do, say that because uh, I think we could go for another three hours here. Um, I'd love to do a theoretical deep dive into humanity's future. And that's something that could potentially include artificial intelligence. From your perspective, um, what could humanity actually look like Let's just say for now, a century from now, um, what what could humanity look like in its best case scenario, and how should we how can we guide our actions today to produce the best possible outcome a century from now? Well, you know, part of my role is to be a futurist, um, and the the role of the futurist has become pretty complicated. When I uh, first got interested in futurism, I used to subscribe to the Futurist magazine when I was a teenager. And that was corporate futurism. That's like, you know, what kinds of um, gadgets might be popular next year? You know, what kinds of colors of clothes are going to be popular, that kind of stuff. Um, But once people started to take the acceleration of technology seriously, the Kurzweilian exponential curves, um, it became a lot harder to talk about prediction in any way. The idea of the singularity, which is problematic, but um, the, the, ba- the core idea of it is that um, if we are, if social change is being driven by technology and technology is changing exponentially, then we're reaching a point where we won't be able to predict what comes next. Um, so some of the work that we do is basically to say, look, we know that the values, the the scenario that we're going to face in 2050 or 2010, you know, 2100, that those uh, that that world is going to look back on the speculations that we had now with uh, amusement um, at best, you know, if they're not all dead, um, or despair, and, <laughs> or despair, right? You know, just like you know, people in 1900 trying to imagine what it would be like now. You know, the book Looking Backward was written in. Uh, 1880. And it was about Boston in the year 2100. And, you know, it didn't get very much of it right. It said you'd be able to listen to orchestras through a a horn in your house. Well, kind of, I guess, you know, maybe. (laughs) Um, But it also thought that we would have done our way with capitalism and everyone would have a job and we're not there yet. Uh, So um, I don't think that we're very good at prediction and, uh, uh, you know, Charlie Strauss says that the singularity is the turd in the punch bowl of science fiction. It's, it's also made science fiction a lot more complicated. Um, but I do think that we are seeing exponential curves in technological acceleration. And I am broadly a technological determinist in terms of my social theory. Mm. Um, and I think that one of the things that we can say is that within any set of technological parameters that we face in the future, there will be more free and less free possibilities, more democratic, less democratic, and that the more democratic and free we can make society today, uh, the more likely it is that we will be able to find those opportunities in the future. So um, even though, and another person I would mention here is John Danaher, who's written excellent work on axiological futurism or how to think about the future values. What does it mean to say, I know that future people will have different values than now, but I still have a responsibility to try to build a world that I think will be the best world for them, right? Even though I know that they're probably are gonna disagree with some of my values. Like I eat meat, but I know that in the future, I'm pretty sure that in the future, people will look back on meat eating as a pretty disgusting thing. But, you know, what can I do? I, yeah, reduce the harms that factory farming is doing and et cetera, et cetera. So it's pretty hard. But yes, I do think that the principal uh, things that are going to change the parameters of social possibility in the future are things like genetic engineering, biotechnology, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology. Um, And 
Uh, some of the ways that we can see the proximate effects of that will be uh, automation of work. I'm, I'm still pretty convinced, even though we haven't seen very much evidence for it yet, but I'm still pretty convinced that um, automation of work is going to continue to um, uh, have a profound effect on careers and jobs and the opportunity to to work in the future, that a lot of the jobs that people are training for now probably won't exist in the future. Right. Um, I think I don't believe in post scarcity. I don't, I don't think that that's what's in the future because I think we can always want more um, than what we've got. Uh, so the idea that oh well now everybody can be fed, aren't you all satisfied? And it's like no, I want more than just to be fed. You know, um, so I, I don't think it's going to be a post scarcity society. But I think that um, we're all going to be connected through the internet, and that that's going to have some profound effects. Hopefully, one of the effects will be the breaking down of nationalism and tribalism globally hasn't seemed to have that effect yet, but right. uh, I do think that in the long run, it'll probably have that effect. So I'm willing to speculate about some of the directions, but it's really hard. Yeah, it definitely is. And I'm glad that you're, you're doing this work and helping us. Um, I hope to have you back on soon, uh, genuinely. And, um, everyone who's listening, please check out citizen cyborg. I just got it started. Uh, Go get it on Amazon. Or do you have it on Audible? Do you know if it's uh, listenable yet? I have gotten permission to record the Audible book. Um, I just don't uh, have the energy to do my <laughs> own voice. So I, I have to find somebody you know, who has a nice voice. Ah, to do it for okay. Me. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> great. And then um, you mentioned John Danaher. Um, are there, uh, you know, I learned your name from Anders. Who would you recommend that I talk to next? Uh, what's the the, pro, the the logical progression of the transhumanist discussion for the future of our species? And who should I be speaking to? Well, if you're interested in the ecological stuff, um, a person that I've been very uh, excited by is Lee Phillips, uh, who's um, worked on the questions around nuclear energy and genetically modified crops. And basically, you know, arguing against some of the Luddite uh, trends in ecological thought, um, and from a progressive, socially progressive point of view. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's, there's, I have a long Rolodex, so we'll have to, uh, connect offline and I can definitely give you some leads. Uh, that'd be huge. Well, James, thank you so much for your time today. And I'm really looking forward to the next conversation. You too. And good luck with your work. <laughs>